Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries and Recovery. Uh, this is session 53 that we started a year ago last March uh, when the pandemic was declared to talk about what that meant, what, uh, what is a library if the building is closed. And that led to one topic after another uh, over the past, whatever that 14, 15 months now. Uh, we took a few weeks off here in the summertime and a lot of people are taking summer off. We've had a record number of uh, out of office responses. So I appreciate everybody making the time today in July to tune in and see what's up. So. We have two stories. We have at least one story, but we're trying to get the other story, which is recorded. Uh, but we also have a live story, and that's from Kelvin Watson in Las Vegas. So we are the Ubit Libraries Network, and uh, we are host uh, or producing these uh, in partnership with uh, IFLA. Uh, Kelvin Watson is now the executive director of Las Vegas Clark County Library District. Very recently, I believe within the last year, Kelvin. Uh, first, we're going to do uh, our check in on COVID, which is why we started these in the first place. So that is uh, better and worse. It's, you know, it's worse because it's a bloody pandemic. But unbelievably, we have had uh, an amazing accomplishment with these vaccines, which seem to be really effective at keeping people safe from the disease and, and, uh, and the side effects of that. Uh, the US originally was the number one case in the world. We had 25% of all the cases on the planet for, it seemed like most of last year. The vaccines came around, the, the practices of distancing, mask, masking, took hold and uh, the cases dropped radically. Um, they're tilting back up now because we have this new variant and which is much more transmissible. And so more people catching it again. Uh, the variant seems to be for the moment resistant or not resistant to the vaccines. But the point of these, these viruses is they mutate constantly and and they try to find a way around. They never stop. The vaccines are fixed. The virus is highly, dy extremely dynamic. And so the point of all that is we need to pretend or pre assume that this uh, pandemic is going to run for a long time, even as it changes different forms. Uh, and that's not the only disaster. We started looking at this, but there are other things that have been going on. Fires and cyclones. We, we touched on these are slides from last year. Incredible number of fires in California. And everybody's been following the heat domes. There's another one or like two that are coming now. Uh, we had this massive windstorm in the middle of the country that flattened 40% of the Iowa corn crop in an, in an afternoon. Massive uh, weather uh, events driven by climate change. Had two hurricanes hitting the Gulf Coast at the same time. We already have the earliest uh, named storm on record this year. And now, you know, the second one's percolating. So, uh, and Harvey, uh, unbelievable amount of water fell on Houston. Uh, you know, uh, near an outskirt of Houston, they had five feet of water uh, fall from the sky. That's, that's absurd. Um, so libraries, the point is that libraries are being forced into this role as responder as a, as a second responder, if you will, uh, in these emergencies and disasters, whether you like it or not, people are just going to show up at your door. What do we do? What's going on? Is anybody coming here? Can we get any supplies? All those things you, you just have to prepare for. <clears throat> and I regret to say that it, it certainly appears like this is not going to get any better. So with that happy news, um, we other, the other thing that we've really talked about a lot is access and, and how 
the the pandemic has cut off people from their sources of, of information and and services education being the most prominent thing that that uh, has affected everybody uh, because of schools closures uh, but it's just made the the digital so called digital divide uh, into a, a chasm an unacceptable level of infrastructure development that allow people to just to not allow people to participate <clears throat> and so our response is just for the library standpoint that there should be uh, some kind of an access point, a public access point near everyone, you know, within a few minutes walking distance. So it plays a kind of a role of a phone booth, uh, 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 an emergency call box, uh, e-government kiosk, and of course the library access point uh, for all the digital services the libraries provide. And, and while that's not a perfect solution, it's a backup or maybe it's a it's a first solution for a lot of people but it's something that we've been working for uh constantly uh even better if you can get a librarian to show up out there so uh that's what we call this uh neighborhood library access station strategy with that uh we are going to turn to our first speaker kelvin watson uh, Kelvin's returning to us uh, from, I think this may be your third visit, Kelvin, uh, and we are happy to have you and, and we want to congratulate you here publicly on your, your new gig in Las Vegas. It must be a real change from, from uh, uh, Broward County, the county just north of Miami-Dade, though they're both very large systems. And we're delighted to have you back. We'd love to hear what your experience is in, in, the, in these two systems, kind of practically East Coast, almost West Coast. The West Coast where it's extremely hot, you know, I'm wondering if that's affecting you uh, and whatever else is going on. And good to have you, Kelvin. So I'm gonna stop screen share right now and turn it over to you, Kelvin, welcome. All right, thank you, Don, and good morning, and or good afternoon, everybody, uh, depending on where you uh, where you are. So, um, so I've been here, Don, at the Las Vegas Clark County Library District now for uh, next week. It'll be five. Um, it'll be five months. So, uh, as Don mentioned, I was previously at the uh, Broward County Library System in in Florida, and so. I'll get this out of the way because most people ask me this: How am I? How am I dealing with the heat and the weather? Uh, I'll tell you today: the, the the forecasted high is supposed to be 115, <laughs> which is supposed to break the record, which was uh, set at 113. So, um, so I'm dealing with it. Um, I stay in the air conditioning uh, is is what I do, um, and uh, try not to get out there in the, in the, in the, in the heat. Uh, it's, it's, it's a different heat. Just let me let, I'll say that as well. Uh, it's not as humid if, as it is in, uh, in Florida and in, in the other places that I, that I've lived. So, uh, the heat is somewhat different. It just feels like it, it's a sauna. That's what it feels. It's just a, a sauna without the, without the quote unquote humidity. So from a library perspective though, um, you know, transitioning, uh, I left Broward in February of this year. And at that point, Broward County Libraries, we had, um, uh, we, were, we were just opening up at probably about 60 or 70%. Um, we weren't at full capacity at that point. We were still doing curbside service or providing curbside service, which is what a lot of libraries have been doing. Uh, and actually Broward is still offering that full uh, full uh, curbside service to uh, to customers who don't want to uh, come into the library, and Broward is still doing a lot of virtual uh, virtual programming. Um, so things are pretty much still the same in Broward after after the, the even though you know nearly five months after I've, after I've left, um, you know it, things are opening, but there's also uh, uh, that that hesitancy to stop delivering the curbside service and some of those other services that they had uh, that they had begun. 
So I think they're plugging along as other libraries are. Um, and I'm, you know, here in Las Vegas, and it's a totally different experience. Uh, when I got, uh, got here in February, uh, we were um, not doing any library, in library programming, we were doing curbside service. But immediately, it seemed like we transitioned when the uh, when, when folks started getting vaccinated. I actually got my vaccine um, two weeks after I arrived here in Vegas. Um, one, because unlike in Florida, the Las Vegas Clark County Library District, the stat, the library staff um, are considered um, first responders. It's not, it's not something to Don you know, um, you know, mentioned uh, essential workers. And so that allowed me to, uh, I guess, say, get to the front of the line to take, uh, to, to get the vaccine. Unlike, uh, again, what I would have had to wait uh, longer to do that in, in Florida. And so um, we, we quickly, though, transitioned to uh, when, the, when the vaccine was, was, was introduced from 60% open, 70% open, and June 1, we are 100% open. Uh, we are, I think, uh, probably doing curbside, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, maybe at one or two of my branches currently still. And that's because we just kept it, we just kept it in place. And that was, at, you know, and soon we'll be, we'll be probably moving away from curbside altogether. We've also removed all of the, uh, the PP, uh, the, the, the PP, uh, uh, P, the protection of plexiglass, all of that has actually been removed here at all of my locations. Uh, one, because um, for several reasons. One, we didn't want to continue to have this, uh, this interaction or non-interaction with the customers. Uh, our, our staff had built barricades around their, the service points. <laughs> so, uh, so as to eliminate that, we just went ahead and um, removed the Band-Aid. Uh, we've also stopped with the quarantining of materials as well, uh, similar to what other libraries have been doing. Uh, most recently, I have also been selected to serve on the Realm uh, Steering Committee, which some of you may be aware of. That's the OCLC, um, uh, Battelle, uh, the research that was being done um, around COVID and the quarantining of material. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually um, having my orientation call today <laughs> regarding that uh, for my, my first steering committee meeting next week. Um, you know, because of my, my experience um, in, in two large library systems uh, and because of uh, the, the other work that, I, uh, that I've been doing with, with libraries. And so I would say that as we continue, Don, Don mentioned some of this, so I'm going to pick up on some of his comments and I'm going to put them in my words. Um, you know, libraries, and, and, you, and you'll see this from Anaheim Public Library, the most recent uh, LJ uh, Library of the Year that was announced the other day. But what, what Anaheim did and what, what I'm doing and what other library systems are doing, such as yourself, is, you know, we are, we are here for you. That, that's, the, that's the mantra. We're here for you. Um, and now we're going to be here for you back in a physical standpoint, standpoint uh, as, well, uh, as well as virtual. Um, and then what I've been focusing on here, Don, is uh, replicating a lot of the, the, virtual, uh, the virtual partnerships that I had in Broward. And so that is working closely with schools. Uh, we plan on having that up and running in the fall. That's something that Las Vegas Clark County and the Clark County School District hadn't established. So we're, we're, we're planning for the fall. That integration looks like it's moving forward. We're having weekly meetings with the vendors, with the schools. Um, I've had uh, meetings with the superintendent. So that's moving forward. Uh, other entities that, that I'm working with here. Okay. Now, what, yeah, yeah, Don. Those, uh, those partnerships or the activities, the collaborations, what they might look like? Yeah, so this this partnership with this with CCSD is going to be a a, a integration with their uh, Follett Destiny software. So the school students currently have access to Follett ebooks e via their desktops, hmm. and what we're doing is we're going to integrate 
working with uh, with and I, and I hate to use vendors, but that's how I'm going to have to explain it with Baker and Taylor's Access 360, which is owned by Follett, you can seamlessly integrate public library content onto the student's desktop. Wow. And the and the content will just show this shows up. It just says, you know, you got to kill a mockingbird to kill a mockingbird. And then you got another copy of to kill a mockingbird. And it says underneath that one that this uh, that this uh, book has been or is being provided by your local public library. And so that's so it's a seamless access. Uh, the, the vendor is doing all the work. There's no IT. There's no barriers to access. So the student does not have to have a library card to get to have this access to this content. So as we just remove the barrier uh, again, and and for and for Clark County, in our schools we have uh, four library districts. My library district being the largest and covering the entire county, but we have smaller systems where, in cases uh, like in North Las Vegas, those students aren't able to because of funding they don't have the same access as students in other parts of uh, the county, say in Henderson or Boulder City or students that are primarily or are, are served by, by my district. So that's what the school, that's what the school integration will be done. It's really supplementing their, um, uh, their resources. Uh, but then it also will spill over into the public because the Access 360 platform that we're gonna bring up is also gonna be used by the public as well. So it's not, it's not exclusive to the schools, it's, it's a countywide product, but we're, we're doing this special integration with schools. Cool. Um, so you initiated this collaboration or did they reach out to you? <laughs> well, I'll tell you this, some of, this uh, some of these conversations were already taking place before I arrived in February. What I did was, uh, I guess, change the conversation and say that we could bring this up much faster. Uh, similar to what we did in Broward. So I was doing this same um, uh, same or similar in Broward. We did, we did it with library cards though in Broward, as well as removing the barrier of not having the library card. In this case, um, the students won't have to initially start, they won't have to have, a, like I said, a library card or use their student ID for the public library standpoint. It's just, you get the access uh, and it, it's just, it's just much, it's a faster ramp up time. Got yeah. It. Yeah. So other partnerships that I'm working on, um, I'll just mention a few is with our children's museum. So our children's museum here in, in the County is fully opened and we are working with them to actually, um, again, be a, be a supplement to, the uh, the family's learning at the children's museum. So they're if they're studying, if they learning, they're learning something about say the Hoover Dam at the uh, at the uh, museum. Well, we're planning to put uh, a library catalog and or a full uh, uh, library collection near those exhibits in the in the museum. Uh, we're also going to be sharing some of their exhibits in our public libraries. So in our branches. So that's a collaboration, you know, that we're that we're doing to bring, you know, to bridge that um, I say bridge and extend that learning uh, for families, for students, for mothers, uh, you know, parents who bring their children to the museum, but also bring it into the library. And it's just a good collaboration, right? It's just a good partnership. And you you know you know me for a while. I'm all about partnering uh, and and expanding those relationships. Um, the other partnership that we're doing is uh, with our regional transit commission, which is our buses. Uh, you know, yes, Las Vegas has buses. Actually, the most popular one is the one that goes up and down the strip, believe it or not. <laughs> so you got the, tur the tourists and the local folks catching the bus. Um, and, you know, since we're running 24-7 here, you'll see buses going all the time. So we're going to be working with them to uh, help uh, riders uh, and others get um, uh, easy access to uh, to library cards via text message. So they'll scan a QR code and get uh, they'll be able to receive a, a library card. 
Uh, this is in collaboration with one of our partners and then they'll be able to easily access some of the e-content through our uh, through our overdrive uh, system. Uh, and then we're also looking at some similar work that I did in Broward with, which is uh, just some uh, advertising of our, some of our other services on the actual buses, as well as their, uh, uh, the terminals where, where folks are. And this is, this is all part of a, a of a strategic plan that I, and the, the board actually, uh, my board of trustees actually adopted it last night. It, which is our what we're calling our strategic playbook 2026, where it focuses on people, places, platforms, and of course, partners. And so uh, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm working on. Um, and again, I continue to work both in a physical as well as a virtual environment um, to extend uh, our library services throughout the uh, you know, throughout throughout the this 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 county, this it, this this county is much. It, it's a big system. Uh, the difference is bet the difference between this one and and Broward is this one is eight thousand square miles. <laughs> so my so my most uh, uh, the my most northern branch in Broward was probably about forty minutes. My most northern branch here is an hour and a half. Wow. Same thing with the same thing with the most southern branch. So. Um, so that's kind of, those are, that's a little different. Um, uh, but as you know, I've worked in, this is my third large library system, uh, Queens library where I worked, they served as this chief operating officer Broward as the, as the director and now executive director here at, uh, Las Vegas. So that's a little bit, Don, I mean, unless you get, you know, if there's some questions, that's, oh, yeah, uh, that's kind of what's going on. Becoming. Uh, that's that's amazing story and and you know it's not surprising to me because uh, you know uh, this is what you do this is, you, you come in and you you start innovating from the from the get-go and you leverage partnerships and collaborations like nobody I've seen uh, it, it's it's interesting that your district the the uh, the library uh, service area is both uh, highly urban and and also very rural. I can only imagine the density out uh, an hour and a half out of Las Vegas must be eight people that go to that. I mean, <laughs> what's the range of uh, people in the different branches? So you got a million people in your main area, and you've got 150 people in some of the branches. So we've got the the, the makeup is. Uh... We have 13 what we call urban branches, and we have 12 what we call our outlying branches, <laughs> which are the ones that are that are not as, you know, urban. I'm still trying to figure out the difference between the two because in some cases, some of those urban branches to me look like a, a rural or outlying branches. So, we 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 service nearly two million, you know, two million folks certainly um, mostly in these urban areas, but you'd be surprised, like up in Mesquite, um, Mesquite, Nevada. It's a not, you know, we got, we got a lot of folks up there, you know, uh, so, you know, less, no, not a hundred thousand, but say about 50 to 75,000. So you got, you got nice, uh, you know, populations that you're serving, but we also serve, as you know, um, uh, anybody that is visiting, uh, the, the, you know, visiting our area is a, is essentially someone that we serve if any, you know, at, and that happens, right. You walk into the library, um, and you may not, you may be visiting, but you need some assistance. So we serve everybody. So I, I and I, and again, that's my philosophy and always has been. So it certainly goes beyond that, but we've got a library systems. I got a library in Sandy Valley. They don't even have a gas station. Uh, they don't have a gas station. They don't have a, uh, there's not a grocery store. They, um, um, and it's a very, it's a very interesting location. Uh, I went there. So I, I, I so I'm telling you what I, what I actually have seen. Uh, I've actually visited all of my branches, including the one that we have on a mountain. We got a mount, we, in my own, we have a library on Mount Charleston. So we actually have people, uh, living on the mountain and they go to the library and uh, they have their own book clubs. They actually, the day that I went uh, a few weeks ago, they were 
they were planting their uh, planting the a garden. It was a it's a community garden that's uh, it, on the mountain. Uh, the beauty of that is that it's twenty it's fifteen to twenty degrees cooler on the mountain, which is a fact. <laughs> so uh, so so Don, it, it it's interesting to serve these these communities, um, and you know really be uh, be equitable and provide similar access or the same access, right? Because that's the, that's the challenge, right? Because some of them don't have the same Wi-Fi capabilities as, um, as the urbans. So that's, that's a challenge. So uh, those are the ones that, that, I'm, that I'm particularly focusing on uh, when it comes to the digital divide um, you know, in no smaller communities, because again, everyone needs that access, you know, that, that, that Wi-Fi broadband access, that's a utility. That's not, uh, that's not a nice to have. That's, that's a, you have to have, uh, and if people, if people didn't realize that not even just because outside of the library, but when, um, when, 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 you know, when COVID, uh, was, you know, hiding heavy last, uh, last spring and people were, filing for their uh, unemployment benefits, for example. Remember, that was all online. So you had to, <laughs> you had to be able to have that access. And with libraries across the country, mostly, uh, most of us were closed. Our physical buildings were closed. So that is something that, I, I mean, I know I've, I bring that up because people, some people don't, don't think about it like that, right? But libraries were closed. Uh, other places were closed where you, you know, uh, uh, coffee shops were closed, places were closed where you could actually get that Wi-Fi access. Uh, and if you had it at your home or you were able to, 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 um, to, to do these things easily on your phones and your other devices, uh, that's why this, this Wi-Fi is so important and, and access is so important. Absolutely. I, I mean, you can't apply for a job at McDonald's uh, unless you go online. Uh, it has become, you know, an essential service uh, that, that people just can't function. There's so many examples. You can, you know, we just spent a whole hour just listing the things that people use it for and need it for. Right. Uh, right. And, and there's no place that they demonstrate those, that range of needs more than in the library. Because they have, so you mentioned visitors, and that's interesting because if Las Vegas is anything, it's a town of visitors. Uh, so you get people from all over, you said you were open now about to be, or just did fully open, right? Open for hundred percent June one. And are you doing anything differently? Mask requirements, uh, so, distancing, anything? So we are following, um, the governor's and the county's guidelines. And that is, uh, probably similar to most cases uh, or other places. Um, I know that other places are going back to mask, but here we are, uh, the mandate is if you are fully vaccinated, mm -hmm. you uh, are not required to wear a mask. So it's almost it's like the honor system, uh, right. more or less. Uh, we, you know, so you can come into the library. We're not asking to see your... Um, your vaccination card. <laughs> We're not asking for any of that, uh, the proof. We're just allowing you to come in just like Walmart or PetSmart or any of these other places uh, I have you coming in. Um, again, we, uh, we've we removed, our, for our staff, uh, we uh, are not requiring them to wear a mask. We made that optional for, for them as well, for the staff to, for some staff if they felt more comfortable wearing wearing the mask, as I said, we did remove the plexi, uh, the barriers, the plexiglass. We still have um, lots of, uh, uh, continue to focus on the hand sanitizing and providing that to the public. We also have um, uh, air filter, air, air filters in all of our libraries to actually remove some of those airborne, uh, to remove airborne contaminants. We, we put those in place uh, last year. So those are still uh, around. And, you know, I foresee, you know, personally, I foresee this 
uh, you know, hand sanitizing and all these other and some of these mitigating, you know, the, the options for people to remain. Um, but I, you know, I was actually implementing pre-COVID similar um, precautions just for the flu. So yeah. for, for me, I think that, yes, COVID is, it, it's here. I agree with you. There's going to be, you know, the variants, but I think that we also have other, uh, uh, other things like the flu and other things that we need to continue to be uh, focused on and, you know, trying to, uh, uh, especially from a library perspective, continuing to provide, uh, you know, the, the soap, the hand washing, the, the sanitizers and all of those things again. And this was something that I was doing pre-COVID. Yeah. It makes sense. Uh, you know, uh, the, the fact that, that uh, this virus is going to be with us because they're just going to be people that have it uh, for a long time. How, if it gets more serious or not, we just don't know yet. And as you say, it's not the only thing out there. Flu has been out there forever. Uh, it could, it could always be more serious. We've had more serious flu in the past and, mm -hmm. and there are other viruses that, you know, are predictable to come along. We had, uh, uh, we had SARS, uh, you know, in what early two thousands, uh, somehow that one was contained, uh, you know, they're just, these things are coming. And so the, the your, your statement and your goal of, of creating, uh, an environment that is as, uh, as safe as possible that protects from, especially airborne, which is where this, well, not only, but especially airborne. And the ventilation has proven to be one of the big, big factors in this. Uh, I remember early on, we were saying, well, if you're, you know, if you're six feet away from somebody, you're cool. Uh, well, no, you're not, right. uh, depending on the airflow. And there was an example where they had a, you know, a, a table of people that were dining and, you know, they, several of them had it and there were two tables on either side of them and nobody got it, but there was a table across the room and they got it because the airflow took it all over there and it accumulated in that, in the corner where the other table was. Right. And, and so air circulation is proven to be really an important factor in, uh, in transmission. So, uh, that's, uh, that's real smart. And I think you're right. I think we're in, a, in this for a long time. I think people are going to be generally more distant. They're just, it's just going to be safer enough for enough people that they're, that the density that we've experienced in the past is going to, is going to go down. Um, speaking of air and you touched on it, uh, a lot of people must be walking in looking for some cool air just cool air, any, you can put anything in it as long as it's cool. Uh, and, and so are, are, are you seeing a, a kind of an uptake uptick of uh, people coming in for relief or is there just air conditioning everywhere in Las Vegas? I, I, I think there's air conditioning everywhere in Las Vegas. Um, we are not, uh, interestingly enough, we are not officially designated as cooling centers here in Vegas. Libraries are. Um, whereas in New York and in Broward County, for example, we were designated cooling. Yeah. You know, uh, so, so I find that interesting, but I think it's also part of how uh, governmental, it's more, it's more political in, 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 than, than um, in, in those places than here because we're our own independent district and I don't, we don't report uh, into any county or city mm. government, which is in New York and in Broward, it was you know, somewhat different. So we, so, so our, so I haven't seen necessarily any particular uptick, but speak, you know, air conditioning is pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Um, and it runs all the time. I got my, my Nevada energy bill, the other day. So, so I can tell you that uh, it's probably triple what my bill used to be in, in power. <laughs> but, um, but uh, you know, um, there are official city uh, cooling centers. Um, I was in 
you know, one of my branches yesterday. So I'm in a, and I'm, my, my office is connected to one of, uh, to one of our buildings, our windmill library center. So, so I've, I'm in the libraries, um, often, um, and with, I was quite, um, surprised, but happy. We are, we, we've got summer, our summer challenge, summer learning going on and libraries are full. Families are in there, the children are in there and uh, we're seeing it definitely an increase in in our in our foot traffic in the libraries. Very interesting. Uh, I I hope your electricity keeps going because <laughs> you need it. Uh, we were looking at pictures of Lake Mead the other day, and that puppy is down 150 feet. And I, that was a couple of weeks ago. I don't know what it is now. Lake Mead, 150 feet. Uh, they were saying that it's getting, you know, if it goes down, keeps going down, then they won't be able to generate electricity through the dam, through the Hoover Dam, which is a marvel, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but you need water. And the West is short on it and, and long on the heat that's evaporating it. Uh, this is a lead up to kind of, you know, strategic thinking. Uh, if the if things get worse, are you doing any kind of scenario planning on what could happen? What kind of worst case scenarios could happen, or or just pretty much taking it as day by day? So I I specifically am not doing anything. I'm I'm certainly going to be relying on uh, the folks who've been here much longer than I have and seeing uh, you know the ebbs and flow of how things happen in Las Vegas. Um, you know, just the five months in, though I've though I have been um, uh, working and implementing and being innovative, I'm also still learning um, every day. So, um, and that's a uh, uh, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm in the learning curve and handling it as it some of it as it as it flies. Sure, sure. What else, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it doesn't stop. <laughs> uh, right. No, that, that, that's fascinating. Well, what's your, what's, uh, uh, what's your staff, uh, situation? Like how many people and are you, are you experiencing turnover or we've seen a lot of that in the field, uh, recently yeah. people going out of work for 30 years. I've, you know, it's time. So what interestingly, interestingly enough, um, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. That's a good question. So, so we're, we're at about approximately 700 staff, um, we, last year, uh, prior to my arrival, the library uh, district implemented, um, a, we'll call it a COVID plan. Um, we looked at the funding and offered a voluntary early separation plan to individuals who were ready to uh, retire. Another thing that the library did, which was interesting, even though we were we were closed to the public and people and, and staff was not reporting into work. The library district still paid for all of their salaries, full salaries. Uh, so when we did our budget, we just did the budget. Um, and our budget is based on sales tax and property tax. So I, <laughs> we, we're in, a, in, a, in great shape uh, because the more people that come to Vegas, the more sales tax revenue <laughs> comes to the library district. And with the housing prices being what they are and the market being what it is out here, there's a lot of people relocating from California. And of course I relocated from Florida. So um, the housing market is certainly helping property taxes are certainly helping us. So we actually are you know, looking pretty good when it comes to budget we didn't have to do any layoffs we are actually beginning to hire um some of the uh, positions that are vacant we're bringing folks on or looking at if that position was really needed or if we needed to reclassify it to another position uh so we're in the hiring mode actually uh, i'm i'm going to be involved in some interviews on monday for some regional managers which is um which are new positions actually that we've just added with the reclassification of some positions, as well as with money that we, uh, we've, we've recouped all of the VESP payouts 
at a hundred, you know, all of them, all the best payouts that we did the voluntary early separations, we've got, we've recouped all of that money back. Wow. Wow. That's fantastic. I don't suppose there's a sales tax on people buying poker chips. Is there? Uh, if you buy them, if you buy them here, it's it, it, anything you buy, anything you, any money you spend here in Vegas helps to uh, support, <laughs> support the library. So, uh, yeah, you know, we go, yeah. we go into the coffer. So whatever you buy, that's, you know, your food, that's your, you know, the travel, the plane tickets, whatever it is, where they charge those sales tax. Uh, I get a, I get a piece of that. That sounds better than the lottery. <laughs> that sounds better than the lottery. Yes. And you know, we got casinos every, we have uh, slot yeah. machines everywhere. Yeah. Here. There are, 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 do you have a foundation? We do have a foundation as well. Yeah, we, uh, we do have a foundation. Um, and they are very supportive. Um, we also, um, we take any uh, of our weeded material and um, most of whatever is donated, uh, donated resources, books to us. Um, and we, uh, we have bookstores in our, uh, in several of our libraries. And so we generate almost $400,000 a year in book sales, re in book sale revenue that goes back to the library. Wow. Yeah, that's that's significant. I've, I haven't seen that. Uh, and, and we're not working with, you know, any vendor. This is some this is work that we yeah. that we're doing. Yes. That's sensational. That's a that's a load. <laughs> that is. <laughs> that's great. We, we have a little bookstore in in uh, my hometown. Uh, it's only 7000 people, and it's, but it's open three days a week and it generates around forty thousand dollars worth of uh, worth of book sales. And, and it is. They people won't stop turning in books, and uh, it's it's a, it's a great activity that that promotes reading. I, we almost think of it like it's like book rental. You know, you go buy a book for a couple of dollars, you read it, and then what are you going to do with it? Take it back. <laughs> right, right. It just kind of keeps going over. Uh, we've gone way over with you, Kelvin. And I appreciate you taking no, all this no, time. No, no problem. Fascinating to chat with you. Uh, uh, I'd like to. Uh, uh, Close with close you with with one more question about a more general social question. Uh, first time you came on, it happened to be we'd already planned it and never scheduled a thing, but it just happened to be right after the Floyd murder, and you talked about uh, you know uh, what it was like for uh, the library world to deal with what they think of as their own biases and that that it that can be really subtle and you think you know i'm open to all so you know i'm cool but in fact maybe you're really seeing the world through uh, through tinted lenses and you're actually behaving in such a way that's discriminatory uh, uh, uh based on skin color so a lot of things have happened since uh, since uh, the Floyd uh, killing, there've been the Black Lives Matter. We've demonstrations. We've had the jury trial. We've had more. A lot of stuff has happened. I'm just wondering if you can, if you have a take. I mean, this is just you, Kelvin. This is not yeah. a library responsibility. A take on whether you feel like, you know, things are really changing. I, you know, this is a tough one because it. Oh, I, well, you know me. I'm pretty honest always. So I'll tell you. So I. So a few things have happened, as you said. A lot of lots of things have happened and transpired. Transpired, including um, my participation in a couple of my, my personal participation in a couple of, of projects. One, um, I worked with um, with the publisher to write the foreword to their book. Um, understanding and navigating discrimination in America, and um, it was launched at uh, the ALA uh, virtual midwinter uh, conference. Um, and so, I, I had an opportunity to do some reflecting and make some comments. And again, uh, this full this was actually done after the employee killing, after protests and. You know, it's really a uh, the, the book is really a guide to helping, uh, again, people understanding how to navigate this, you know, discrimination and really understanding, you know, some of the you know, more of the history. And, and there's more being more being written every day, the 1619 project. And you should probably been following that as well. And what's been happening in the University of North Carolina. Um, 
I also had the opportunity to participate in, with in an interview with Dan Rather, as you know. Um, yeah. uh, uh, again, I, forgot to, I forgot to ask you to tell that no, story. No, uh, <laughs> around uh, <laughs> around his uh, around his book uh, that's now be uh, turned into a graphic ni- ni- novel. What unites us, and I want to mention the title "What Unites Us" for a certain you know, for a particular reason. But you know, the, to to answer that question, along with getting back to what unites us, I think that we still have a tremendously long journey ahead of us. Uh, Even with the progress that has been made, again, this is my opinion, so I appreciate that, is that these are just continued steps in the process. Uh, We have not even again, looking at what happened with with um, at the University of North Carolina, just a few, just over the last few weeks, that that is a that is a uh, uh, that's evidence to me. Again, we still have a we've got a long journey still ahead of us. Uh, there's still a lot of learning. There's still a lot of acceptance. We still we need to focus on what is what is it that is uniting us and what is it that separates us? And, you know, I, uh, and the team here, we, 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 uh, we, we put together uh, a diversity, equity, uh, inclusion, accessibility plan. Um, And, and, and when I communicate about the plan and the staff is, you know, beginning to get on board, it's not, this isn't about just what's happening internally with our, with our hiring practices, but this is how we, as the library, um, interact with our public. How do we interact with the with our partners? You know, are we are we looking at minority women-owned business partners when we look to buy our our products? How do so so? You know, that's how library. You know, libraries certainly can play that you know that role, and we have a role and responsibility there. But as a as a country. Yeah, we still got we still got many, 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 many more paths to uh, to go and you know to, to get to where uh, we won't have to have these conversations, or at least the conversations won't be as uh, uh, as as uh, as terse or or, um, or or conflicted or whatever the word is. I'm trying to find that we won't have to have these conversations, but no, we haven't. We haven't even, uh, again, we haven't even, uh, you know, scraped the surface. Uh, it's it's really daunting, I guess we can <laughs> understate uh, the circumstance. It's just so encoded in our culture uh, that we're either blind to it or we embrace it or, you know, we're just oblivious and, and, and that doesn't help either. So I appreciate everything you're doing and I appreciate you sharing this with us because it's just really a, an opportunity to, to talk about these things in the context of well, what we're doing, which is talking about libraries in the world. And, and uh, of course we have a technology bent, uh, but uh, I wanted you to uh, close with the, the story about uh, what we have and uh, what unites us. And that project, that extremely cool project that you put together with the publisher, that's that's a new thing. I'd never heard of anything like that. But license deal. Tell us about that. Well, so uh, I'll make a long story short. So um, it happened, you know, when I when I arrived here in Vegas, uh, the um, I and and you know, some of you are aware of the uh, the the Macmillan Library relationship pre-COVID when, when Macmillan was considering and, and actually began to implement an embargo actually on their, on their, uh, on, on their, um, uh, some of their books that they were you know, licensing through the aggregators to libraries, uh, where that was going to be an eight week embargo, which actually the Dan Rather book, what unites us would have been one of those books that they would have embargoed. Um, and of course, COVID happened and, and, and they, and they changed, uh, they changed course. And of course they had some leadership changes over there as well, but I've worked with those folks for many, many years, um, in, 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 in different aspects on the, on the library side, as well as on the, 
on the book side uh, when I worked at Borders and, and when I worked at Ingram. So um, they came to they so they work with a company called Biblio Labs and and I've got a, had a long relationship with with them, including implementing the Black Caucus of ALA's ebook awards and so and, and you know Don, I've been in this technology ebook space and just doing a lot of work. And so they approached me and said, uh, "Hey, Kelvin, we're thinking about this. We want to we want to do it with you, and we want to do it with Las Vegas. What do you think about it?" And um, and oh, by the way, wouldn't it be cool if you interview Dan Rather? And I said, well, yeah. Well, actually, that's the only way I'll do it is if I get to interview Dan Rather, first of all. Good uh, sec- second of all, uh, we, we don't, I just don't want to make the book available to library, uh, to the library customers of Las Vegas Clark County Library District. I want to make the ebook available to everybody in the whole state of Nevada. And so, uh they what was, agree what was your initial reaction to that one you uh, what you well, what <laughs> you know so if we if you're gonna if you're gonna go do it you know i always say go big or go home right <laughs> so we're gonna go big and we're gonna see if, if if this is gonna be a pilot let's go let's go do a pilot um and see and see how we can make it happen so it's based on geolocation so it's based basically anyone that lives in or lives works, plays, visiting, whatever, you, you can go to uh, our site, that link that we have that provides you the access and uh, you, you can have access to this ebook for, uh, we're going to offer in two months. So beginning Jul- July the 5th, um, for two months, you have access to Dan Rather's graphic novel ebook, What Unites Us. Uh, and the interview would really, the interview just is, uh, icing on the cake, right? It's really, uh, a, 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 it's some, some people are calling it a love letter to libraries, uh, a conversation. And so, um, and, and, and it's really, you know, as you, as you watch it, Don, it's me, uh, I listen to the, I listen to what unites us. So I actually came up with the questions um, and was, these are things that I wanted to discuss with uh, Mr. Rather. And so, uh, you know, I asked him questions and he, uh, you know, at nearly uh, 90 years old, he was able to answer them and give, you know, some in-depth responses. And yeah, and we cover multiple topics. We cover the civil rights yeah. movement. We cover conversations with presidents. We cover, you know, uh, nationalism and patriotism. We cover, uh, uh, you know, libraries. We cover his love of books. We we cover family. Yes, you know, it's a whole it's yeah. a whole gamut of of just a great com almost an hour, fifty six minutes, a conversation between Dan Rather and I. And so that's what the project. That's how it started quickly. Uh, that's what the project is, and it's one of uh, the first of its kind. Um, and we, um, and, and I'm looking forward to, uh, and have challenged other, um, publishers and aggregators to do the same, uh, not necessarily, they don't have to necessarily do it with me, but that they think about doing similar projects with, uh, the public libraries as well. Great. Well, that, that's, uh, that's really interesting because we just did 56 minutes with Kelvin <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and we're going to close here. Uh, really appreciate this, Kelvin. It's been it's been great to visit with you again and, and learn about the new situation that you're in and all the things you're doing. Uh, wonderful work. Uh, keep it up. And thank you, sir. Uh, I, I want to uh, let everybody know that we were not able, to, as you would have figured out by now, able to get the uh, the librarian from the American Library in Paris to visit with us today. Mm-hmm. We had a, a recorded video, but we weren't able to play that either. So we'll either get actually Audrey herself or her video on at a future session. But uh, with that uh, apology uh, and uh, another thank you for our special guest, Kelvin Watson, uh, we'll close today's session and we'll hope to see you next week. We've got a couple of sharp shooters coming in talking about infrastructure it'll be exciting everybody i know and uh we'll learn something else thanks again and we'll see you soon all right thank you don thank you everybody take care have a great rest of your day and a great weekend